On the surface, the SAT is just a test. You answer 154 questions about reading, writing, and math, and you receive a score based on the number of problems you answer correctly. However, underneath all of this is a secret game being played. The SAT asks the same questions on every test. Bringing our attention to the math portion of the exam, you'll see a list of 58 problems that on any normal test, you would have no way of knowing were coming. But what the College Board won't tell you is that these 58 problems come from a problem bank of a few hundred that they choose from on every test in every year. Sure, they might switch out a six for a four or turn a farmer selling apples into a dealership selling SUVs, but the structure and solution of the problems remains the same. If you're starting to feel overwhelmed, don't worry. There are actually 300 types of problems that the SAT could ask you. For example, there's about 20 different ways that they've come up with that involve solving a linear equation. But my point isn't that you have to memorize hundreds of problems to do well on the test. It's that you can anticipate trick problems because there just aren't that many of them. These are the problems that will trip you up and slow you down, stopping you from taking the time to solve the easier problems that will help boost your score. So to save you from wasting your time and losing out on those last few points, I have combed through dozens of tests from practice books and real life exams and collected five of the most common trick questions that you'll find on the SAT. First on the list, we have problems like this one, super complicated fractions where we are asked to rearrange for one of the variables. This looks like it would take forever, but we can use substitution to get rid of these complicated terms and then put them back in at the end. In this problem, we're asked to solve for p. We can notice that these three terms here don't have any p's in them. So let's call this term a, this term b, and this term c. Now, all we have to do is simple algebra. We need to solve for p, so let's get it on its own. First, we multiply both sides of the equation by c to remove it from the denominator of this fraction. And then, divide both sides by a and b to fully isolate p. And now that we have p all on its own, we can plug back in our values for a, b, and c to get our final answer without any confusing algebra. For our second entry, we have problems that ask us to solve for sine or cosine of 90 minus a variable. This often trips people up, and they try and draw triangle diagrams and look for the relationship between sine and cosine to try and find their answer. You can do it this way, but it's easier to know what the SAT is looking for instead of trying to blindly find it. The trick here is that the sine of an angle is equal to the cosine of its complement, which is a word for 90 minus that angle. So in this problem, if we know that the sine of x is equal to 4 fifths, the cosine of 90 minus x is also 4 fifths no calculation needed. With number three, we have a question that if you've never seen it before, might drain your time just from the amount of reading that you'll have to do. We have a paint job with a formula for how much it will cost, and are asked if we change the paint, which of our answers will also change. The way you're supposed to solve this problem is to go through your four options and consider whether each one will change or not. In this case, changing the type of paint doesn't affect the height or length of the walls, nor the number of walls since you're just covering the same walls with different paint. This leaves us with just k, some unknown constant. The faster way to solve these problems is to understand that the constant is always the answer, because the product being used for whatever job we are trying to do is not going to change the number of things, whether that's lawns that need to be mown or walls that need to be painted, that actually end up needing to be done. Next up, we have another essay that the SAT is looking for you to read, but that can also be easily simplified by knowing what it is that they're looking for. We are given a survey and some information about the survey and are asked which of the following is an appropriate conclusion of the survey. To answer this question quickly, we have to resist the urge to read through the entire problem. We only have to find out who they actually interviewed and then we can jump down to the answers. In this case, we interviewed 300 people with bad eyesight. This is what we call our sample and it is taken out of a larger population, which in this case is a large group of people with bad eyesight. What the SAT is looking for here is for you to recognize the difference between what you can say about a population and how that's different from what you can say about a sample. We could say, of the 300 people tested, people who received treatment X had better results than those who did not. But we cannot say that if we tested more people, then those people will also have better results. We can say that they might have them or that we would expect them to have them, but you cannot make a definitive statement about people that you have not yet surveyed. Sometimes you will still have two answers left to decide between, but oftentimes, like in this case, 
By noticing we have three definitive statements about a population, that cannot be appropriate even if they line up with the data, we know our answer is D. Finally, we're not going to be looking at one specific problem, but any problem involving standard deviation. This is the formula for standard deviation. If you wanted to calculate it for this problem, these are the calculations that you'd have to make. The College Board is not looking for you to do this in a test where you only get a minute or two for each problem. Instead, you have to look at the shape of the data and determine which data set deviates more from the mean just by looking at it. If we look here, the heartbeats before exercise are bunched around 72, with almost no one at the ends of the visible range. After exercise, each number has roughly the same number of entries, meaning it is much more spread out. Therefore, the standard deviation, or the amount that the data deviates, is greater after exercise than before. I hope this video was helpful. If it was, please consider liking. If you'd like to see more of these videos, then subscribe. I have thousands of problem walkthroughs on this channel, and I'm looking to make more of these types of videos in the near future. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.